Good evening, everyone. How are you guys? Um, <laughs> hi, Pat. <laughs> well, welcome to uh, May's general meeting. Um, so the uh, splatter came out today, and I was looking at there. Uh, if you get a chance, go over to our website, w0eno.org, uh, and uh, check that out. There's a ton of events happening. Um, so many so that I'm not going to go over all of them. <laughs> um, so I believe our next event is our POTA event on the 29th. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, see the website and uh, look at the calendar. There's a form there. You do need to sign up prior to it um, so that we know you're coming. Um, there's some information you see, I see at least two guys with, uh, our shirts and hats. There's some information on if you're interested in those as well, I'll let them talk to that. Um, and then Chuck, I know you said you had some announcements, so I'll let you do those. And then, uh, anybody else that may have announcements before we get on to our presenter tonight. All right. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it running the show this evening since I'm out of town. A um, couple of quick things. Again, keep it on the website. We have events coming up every so often. Uh, Doug's not on, but we are going to try to, he's trying to finalize the um, ARL field day in June. So keep an eye on the website for that uh, location and times and things like that. Also in June, probably the... <laughs> First or second weekend, if I can do it, I'm going to do an ad hoc fox hunt. Uh, the last one I did, we just we did SSTV and uh, had a couple participants. So this one, I'm just going to stick somewhere. I'll give you a general idea where it's at. Go find it and kind of go from there. A little something fun. Keep the club excited. Uh, I did hear Boulder lifted restrictions uh, for COVID. And uh, I don't know what our buildings are doing yet, but I'll follow up with the buildings to find out. So hopefully maybe by July or August, we'll have this live and in person um, if we can get the rooms and get enough people in there. So I got to work with the 350 Terry Street and see what uh, what's available there. So I'm hoping I'm going to meet with him when I get back and uh, we'll go over that and see what we can do. So hopefully uh, this will be in live again. Of course, we'll record it probably over Zoom because um, we have a couple of presentations of people that are not local uh, coming up um, for the rest of the year as well. With that said, also, I think we still have a couple of slots open for anybody that you might know if they'd like to do a presentation for the club, to have them go ahead and you know, contact us or you contact us with their name and we'll see if people are interested in uh, doing a presentation for, for LARC and we appreciate uh, all our presenters. Uh, Ward Silver, N0AX is our presenter this evening. So thank you, sir, for, for participating and uh, doing that for us. We do appreciate it. Uh, other than that, that's all I got left. Anybody else have any other announcements? Oh, I did have one more. Um, we had very successful uh, sign up last, well, two months ago, we sent a sheet out to sign up to buy um, Ed Fong antennas. Um, and hey, Ed, Ed joined us this evening on the uh, Zoom call too. But uh, we ordered quite a few antennas from him, and we're doing it again. Uh, Mike has put, I believe the form's already on the on the website, right, Mike? So if you'd like to order an antenna from Ed Fong, we're doing it as a club. Uh, get out there, get your uh, information in there. We'll get it ordered. Uh, I think we're looking at uh, ordering it uh, late June, I think we said. <coughs> yeah, mid, so, mid to late June. Yeah, mid to late June. Get another big order together so Ed you know, we can keep Ed in business and uh, keep him running. So I'm sure his kids appreciate the, uh, the orders and we appreciate it, Ed. I know a lot of people love their, in, you know, love your antennas and it's, it, they're great. So something to look at as well. And, um, you know, tell your friends, they want order as well. You, know, you don't have to be a club member to order um, and things like that. So let's see if we can get a club group order together and see how many we can get out again. So with that said, if anybody's got anything else, please speak up. Otherwise it's all yours, Mike. I'd also like to remind everybody to vote in the poll that's, I think, on page seven of the splatter. We need people voting on that. 
they can't. Cool. Steve, did you have anything about shirts? No, it's mute. You're muted. Okay, I'm not muted now. Um, uh, <clears throat> Jay uh, made a purchase uh, from a general uh, uh, membership. Appreciate that, Jay. Um, Kat did a lot of work uh, uh, putting together uh, spreadsheets. We should be able to go up there and order. Um, it would be nice if we, when we are able to get out to wear some shirts and hats, you know, hats is a minimum guys. I mean, that's really reasonable. Uh, we're about 25 bucks for a hat. That includes a two and a half inch patch. Harlem uh, Olson makes those embroideries and supplies those to Tommy Prince and then they put it on the, uh, on the hats as well as the shirts and stuff. So, uh, you know, look at that. And I appreciate, uh, appreciate the orders coming through. Uh, the link to order those is in the splatter and I'll get it on the web this week also. Thanks, Kat. You're welcome. Hey. I've got a hey, couple of announcements. Go for it. Okay, we had a, a VE session this past Sunday, uh, resulted in eight new hams licensed. Uh, one got his general as well, and uh, four upgrades, uh, two of which were extra class. Uh, one guy got all the questions correct on the extra and the other one only missed one. So uh, it is possible to do. Our next scheduled test session is Saturday, June 26th, and that will be an ARRL session. So the $15 test fee applies. Uh, the Northern Colorado Amateur Radio Club, NCARC, just up the road, is presenting a new ham class, uh, two sessions, May 19th tonight and the 26th via Zoom. It is free, and they said non-members are welcome. Uh, so anybody that's uh, brand new, wants to learn a little bit about repeaters, radio protocol, equipment, stuff like that, uh, might want to check it out. Uh, for more information, see their website at ncarc.net. That's uh, November Charlie Alpha Romeo Charlie.net. And uh, also, if there's anybody new on here that's having any trouble, you know, getting their uh, radio program to join our two weekly nets that we've got or, or any other questions, uh, there's an email alias, Elmer at W0ENO, that you can send your questions to, and we'll be happy to help you out. Uh, that's all I've got. Okay. Nobody else? Doug, Doug joined us. Doug joined us. Um, okay. Mike, okay. so you want to see if Doug's got any announcements for events coming up? Doug. He was on video and then he went off. There he is. Can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you now, Doug. Okay. Any, yes, any so we're going to have field day over Isaac Walton Park. The pavilion has been reserved. We'll have two uh, HF stations. We'll have a go box and the club 7000 radio. And then we'll have a schedule. We're not planning a social activity like a barbecue. Uh, we're not going to use the uh, spider beam antenna because of the number of people and, and the length of time it takes to put the thing up and take it down. So we'll have some wire antennas and uh, we'll have a schedule for people to come in and operate uh, uh, during the contest and uh, we'll have uh, uh, the more details will become available. You know, we'll be on the air from 12 noon on Saturday the 26th, I think it is, and then uh, Sundays the uh, 27th. Uh, we'll be, uh, Fred will be holding down the fort from midnight to 8 a.m. Sunday and um, so I think it's going to be, it won't be social activity maybe, but I think the city and the county will allow us to have some folks there and uh, we'll have a public area for display and informational ham radio for the people who wander through the door front, front doors of the pavilion. So those are the basics of it. Now we're going to have nine and radio club activities between June 1st and uh, December is uh, 
some of them are. We'll, we'll have three city parades that we support radio to support for. And we will have uh, one race, the Turkey Trot in November. Uh, we provide uh, some critical radio support there for that. It'll be the same type of race that they did in the years in the past. And so um, everybody who's worked there knows what that means. Yeah, that's about all I got. Well, <clears throat> Christmas party may or may not be able to have it. I mean, we should, we, it's a major social event for us and uh, we'll plan for it. And, uh, and we'll be prepared to cancel if required. And that's about it. Hey, Doug, do you know when you will get some of the final stuff on field day together for us? Yeah, I should have it by this time next week. Okay, awesome. I've got one volunteer already. Besides Fred, that's uh, two, me, three. Uh, you know, I'm trying to do it with as, as few people as possible. Uh, we're going to set up the antennas and, and uh, try to make it easy, not so time consuming. Okay, awesome. Looking forward to it. Yeah, we'll use the club radios and we won't be bringing our own. Uh, people can bring the headphones and microphones, uh, whatever they're more comfortable with. Cool. Um, I know I've, I've fielded a bunch of questions about it uh, from outside the club, uh, people wanting to come up to our field day because uh, they've enjoyed it in the past. So. Well, I guess one of the things I'm interested in finding out is what are other people doing? What's uh, Boulder doing? I mean, they'll be out there for sure with any event. Uh, it'll be a controlled situation, same as ours. But uh, And then Northern in Colorado, they had an outdoor field day last year. Uh, they, had, they were set up outdoors in tents and one radio, one tent, and, and one frequency and so on. So that's, uh, I don't know what others are going to I'd like to find out if you hear about anybody else's plan for field day, let me know. I, I yeah, think Northern I Colorado, I, I was going to say, I think Northern Colorado, uh, one of the members, I think, has offered up her property. And I think that's where they were planning on doing, at least from the last meeting uh, that I heard. And then, you know, with me, with uh, Rocky Mountain Ham, we're still going over to uh, South Park, the same thing that we did last year. So those are the two that I know about, Doug. That's an awesome event you have up, up there, Mark. <laughs> I'd like to go to it sometime. Probably would never happen. Come on up. <laughs> okay, get everybody set up and then drive up. So uh, Boulder is uh, planning to have their field day at Potasco, which is what they've done in the past. And uh, right, right now they're talking about not having any restrictions and, uh, and allowing as many people as want to show up to, co to come up. Uh, that, that may change if the, the COVID situation changed, but that's what they're planning right now. Okay, thank you. Years okay. past, years past, we used to have as many as 25 people in that pavilion and and uh, so it became a major social activity we uh, Chuck enjoys barbecuing some hot dogs and hamburgers but uh, I, I, I'm not at this time pl planning on having that kind of social activity okay good good to hear that we're moving uh hopefully forward in in-person events again. And, and like I said, check out the splatter. There is a ton of events on there. Um, almost a whole page of events coming up between now and the end of the year. Um, so um, if that's, if there's no other announcements, uh, I am going to go ahead and turn over to Ward Silver, who is going to talk to us about uh, grounding and bonding, I believe. 
Yep. Okay, should I just launch? Uh, yep, and let me see. I don't remember if I made you. Uh, do, do you have a presentation? Oh, yeah. Huh. Oh, presentation. Yeah, sure. I already uh, made my co host. Okay. Let's see. Slideshow. Here we go. From the beginning. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. All right. That's good. Well, before I start a um, small commercial um, commercial break here, just uh, released latest edition of Ham Radio for Dummies, fourth edition. Got, it got thicker. <laughs> Funny how that works. I'm wearing my dummy shirt here tonight. They send you a free dummies thing. But anyway, uh, a lot of changes this time. And uh, boy, Ham Radio technology is uh, changing pretty fast, isn't it? So. Anyway, this is uh, Desktop Elmer for new hams, and uh, now you know all about it. Okay, so this is a presentation about grounding and bonding. It's for home uh, HF stations, mobile HF stations here. Uh, that's the primary audience, and um, we're going to uh, try to understand what ground and bond mean. The words are often misunderstood. Um, as part of the session, you'll appreciate the different requirements that apply uh, for AC safety, lightning protection, and at RF. These are um, grounding and bonding behave differently at these different frequencies, and we have different needs uh, for protection and uh, grounding and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to talk about what happens in these different frequency ranges. And then um, there are a variety of issues and techniques that apply to home HF stations. I wish I could give a cookbook style talk where step one uh, is this and step one A is this and then step one B and step two and so on and so forth, but it doesn't work like that. This is a kind of a toolbox talk where you learn the basics and the techniques and um, the ideas behind the words and then you go home and you try to apply them to your own circumstances. Mobile stations have their own special issues. And so we'll cover some of that. Power, bonding, um, uh, RF, RF in the shack. You are literally in the shack when you have a mobile station. And we'll discuss about how a common system of grounding and bonding can satisfy all the requirements. So you don't have to do this three times, you do it once, relatively properly and then takes care of things. And then I'll list some comprehensive resources for you to follow up. And I will also provide this as a set of PDF slides so you can share them uh, in your club and you don't have to worry about writing everything down. Okay, the audience here is if you're a home of HF station owner, maybe you're building a new station, this is the perfect time to deal with grounding and bonding because you're just starting, you don't have stacks of equipment, you don't have holes in the wall yet, you don't have wires everywhere. This is the exactly right time to work, learn about grounding and bonding and deal with it. Maybe you're upgrading a small station. We all start with a couple of boxes on a desk or a table and um, then things sort of get out of hand at some point and uh, we have to create our furniture and a bunch of other things. So that's a good time for grounding and bonding. Maybe you added an amplifier. Oh my, uh, time to meet the neighbors and learn about RF in the shack. So this is another good opportunity to learn about grounding and bonding whether you want to or not. If you live in lightning country like in Colorado or Missouri, um, lightning protection is very important. And it's a, a good idea to make provisions for that in your station. And maybe you're just trying for better performance. You want few, less noise, you want um, less RFI, you want a more robust station. Well, this is also uh, in line with the talk. If you're a mobile HF station owner, uh, again, installing a new station. This is the time to worry about power and bonding within the vehicle um, of your equipment and you've got antenna and feed line issues to deal with. And you're also gonna be dealing with RFI and noise because you're right in the um, very near field of the antenna 
um, everything is lit up, as they say. So you have to deal with it or it will deal with you. Here's some ham radio references. The ARRL handbook and the ARRL antenna book are good. I've been uh, shoveling material into those books for the last few editions. So there's um, a lot of good information there. The NEC handbook is available at your library. The NEC itself is just a little book. It's a little tiny thing. It's a sort of a list of legalistic sounding thou shalt's and thou shalt nots, but it doesn't really tell you much in the way of rationale. So what you want is this book. <laughs> this is the NEC handbook. And um, what it does is it takes all those requirements and it uh, provides rationale and drawings and what to do and what you are allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. It's a big, thick sucker. Uh, these are at your library. They're also available used online. Any edition um, up to 2017 or so will probably be current. There has been a new release of the NAC itself uh, in recent years, but most of the things that apply to amateur radio um, are current through 2017. So this is the big book. I think I got this for um, $35 used um, online. So it, look at it this way. It makes a great bookend on your bookshelf. Um, there are three terrific articles that were in QST in uh, 2002. They're by Ron Block, NR2B. He was one of the founders of Polyphaser. And uh, they're very good articles about designing lightning protection for your station. They're available publicly on the ARRL website. Ron was also a uh, reviewer of grounding and bonding for the radio amateur, and I really appreciate his input. Also, Jim Brown, K9YC, has uh, published quite a few uh, really good papers on his website, k9yc.com, and um, uh, slash publish, you can find them. Two that are really good and applicable here are power grounding, bonding, and audio for amateur radio and RFI, ferrites, and common mode chokes for hands. And he has contributed a lot, just won the ARL Technical Award for these uh, various contributions. A couple of good websites, W8JIs. Uh, Tom lives on a hilltop, uh, mountaintop in Georgia with 300 foot towers. So he knows a lot about lightning. And mobile stations, your go-to site is um, Alan Applegate K0BG. And Alan was another reviewer of the Grounding and Bonding book. Speaking of the Grounding and Bonding book, here it is. It's a little book. It's not as big as the uh, handbook, but um, it tries to pull together a lot of this information that previously was just distributed all over. You know, handbooks, papers, guidelines, standards, all this kind of stuff. How was a person supposed to figure this out? There's ah, one of my loyal readers. Thank you, Doug. And um, basically, I uh, wrote a couple articles in Hands-On Radio about the myth of RF ground, and boom, a volcano of correspondence um, uh, erupted. People were really interested in this topic, and so I said to the folks at HQ, I said, I think we need to pull the information together into one, one reference so people can actually find it. They said, have at it. So here's the book. And it covers AC wiring, lightning protection, RF management. Uh, we had a really good set of reviewers. Um, Dale uh, Svetnoff, WA9ENA, is a lightning consultant in the upper Midwest. I already mentioned Ron Block. Jim Brown is a reviewer. Um, local guy, Bill Wiley, WA0BSW, who's a grounding uh, consultant, ARL lab. Um, Good stuff, keep me out of trouble. Everybody thinks I know all this about grounding and bonding, but it was really the reviewers that kept me out of the, out of the weeds. There are a lot of examples in the book for you to apply to your station, but they're, uh, like I said, it's not a cookbook thing. You have to kind of go, hmm, what can I do? How does this apply to my circumstances? What can I do? Where can I put electrodes and, and whatnot? Am I on the first floor, in the basement, on the second floor, whatever? and then apply what's in the book. Let's jump right in. Um, what is ground anyway? Um, 
word ground is wildly overused. Um, it can be a noun where you're talking about a connection to the earth. It's ground. That's what the ground is. And that's typically um, how it's used in the AC and lightning protection discussions. And it can also be just a local reference voltage. A airplanes have grounds, but I've never seen them dragging a chain. Uh, what they talk about is the local reference voltage, and that means the airframe. So um, that works for circuits. It's primarily an RF use of the word. It can be a verb, which means it's an action. I'm going to ground this, this wire. I'm going to ground this connector. Uh, it means connect to the reference potential. And then it can be an adjective to describe a type of a connection, such as a ground wire or a ground system. And it can be all these things at the same time. So you have to be very careful. You can get into sentences like, I'm grounding the chassis to ground or the ground wire. You've got to be careful. The, the Brits have decided to use the term earth, earthing. Uh, when the, we talk about connecting something to the earth, they talk about earthing it uh, with ground being something else. But over here, um, our use of the word is ground. So you just got to be careful. I've heard people having conversations where they're both nodding up and down and thinking they're communicating. And then I listen for a minute. And I realize they're talking about two wildly different things. So you have to be careful. The earth is not. Um, uh, we think, well, I'm just going to throw a ground rod out there, run a rod or two, and all my noise and nasty currents and lightning, it'll just, it'll just go into the, into the earth. Nope, doesn't work like that. Um, it doesn't disperse charge. Um, same thing for vehicle bodies. It's not a magic zero volt. Any um, Earth can be just as complicated and dynamic as wiring in your shack. So you have to respect that. There are also fuzzy definitions. I try not to use the term RF ground because there really ain't no such thing. Uh, uh, RF ground is a very limited concept. You have to be, a, it, it applies to a very small electric, small thing, um, can't be very big, can't have very much current, uh, changes at different frequencies. So it's just a term that gets us into trouble. Ground loops, um, they're not the problem you think they are. Everybody thinks the minute you've got hum or buzz or something like that, well, you got a ground loop. Not necessarily. Furthermore, if you look behind any any ham side, a ham station of any size, you'll see literally dozens of ground loops. Any closed circuit around cables between pieces of equipment that forms a complete loop, that's a ground loop. So uh, you're not going to get rid of them. So what you have to do is manage them. So they're not the problem you think they are, but they can cause problems if you let them. And then there's the single point ground term or star ground sometimes. And when you talk to your electrician, they talk about single point ground. Well, that's fine. They're talking about AC power systems, which are at 60 Hertz. Wavelength there is about 50,000 meters or some ridiculous number like that, 5 million meters, I don't know. Um, it's a lot bigger than a ham station. So what they talk about single points is not what the RF engineer talks about at single point. So it depends. Let's talk about bonding. All that bonding is, you can go look up the uh, definition. It's a connected and in, intended to keep two points, A and B, at the same voltage. That's all it is, is a connection to keep these two points at the same voltage so that everything goes up and down together. When there's a voltage transient or an RF wave comes along or there's a, a magnetic field that causes a current flow, bonding things together keeps everything at the same voltage so it goes up and down. That prevents shock hazards from voltage differences. So you don't want this one to be at 115 volts and this one to be at uh, neutral. That would be bad. Um, you don't want destructive voltage differences that are caused by lightning. Vol lightning has big magnetic fields and it has big electric fields and it has high current. All of these things cause uh, voltages to exist at different points, even on the same wire. You get a big lightning strike on a short piece of wire, you can have 700 volts between two pieces, uh, two points on a piece of wire number 12 straight wire 
that's only one foot apart when you get a big kiloamp size uh, lightning strike. So you want to bond things together to clamp out, clamp down those voltage differences. And you also want to limit current between devices that's caused by the voltages um, that result from RF pickup. Why does current flow? Current flow because there's a voltage difference. So current will flow from here to here. And RF current getting into places that it's not supposed to is what causes RFI. It's not the voltage, it's the current. So if you can minimize the voltage, you can also zero out the current. Um, if you've ever watched a floating dock out on a lake or a river or something, um, they let that dock float so that when the wave comes by, different parts of the dock aren't lifted up and down differently and torn apart. The whole thing goes up and down together. The boats float, the dock floats, everything goes up and down together when a big wave comes by. So that keeps them from being damaged. It keeps things from being yanked apart, all this kind of stuff. Same thing happens in your radio station. Bonding sounds hard. It's not. It's just connecting things together with wire or strap or maybe braid or whatever. Um, it sounds expensive, like you've got to use special welding things and giant phosphor bronze, this and that. Not really. It can be quite inexpensive. All that Romex that we've never thrown away because we might use it someday. Well, now you can use those pieces of wire. Those are perfect for bonding in the station. But it does require using the right connecting materials, heavy wire, the right kind of clamps, the hardware, that kind of stuff. This is not expensive. All the stuff's down at the big box hardware store um, for you to go down there and get. But when you do bonding and you pay attention to bonding, it works in your favor for all three of those different regimes that we talk about, AC safety, lightning protection, and RF management. So think about it, put it make it part of your design process that when you install new equipment or build a station, think about bonding. For Now, for bonding to work, for that connection to keep points at the same voltage, bonding has to be very low impedance. It has to be short at the frequencies of interest. Otherwise, it starts acting like uh, that connection starts acting like a transmission line. Uh, we all know and remember, of course, that a quarter wavelength of uh, transmission line, if it's shorted at one end, it's open at the other. So you can have wild changes of um, impedance uh, if the connector, uh, conductor, sorry, is uh, electrically long enough to start acting like a transmission line. So anything longer than a tenth of a wavelength at the maximum frequency that you're going to use it is probably starting to get to be too long. It also has to be heavy enough to carry the expected current. If you're bonding things for lightning protection, you have to deal with lightning size currents. Um, those can be in the kilo amps, which is a scary thought. Um, and so that's why you see uh, building codes specify things like number six, number uh, four, number two uh, type wire, because if it's not heavy enough, it'll blow up. It'll blow up good. And um, so you don't want that. You want uh, this wire to carry the expected current and perform its bonding function. It also has to be sturdy enough to survive the environment. If it's outside and it's buried in particular, um, you want heavy wires so that you don't accidentally dig them up or hit them with a rototiller. Don't ask how I know this. Um, you don't want to tear up your ground system because you accidentally ran over a wire or something. Things get driven over, stuff gets backed into. The wire needs to be mechanically secure so it can withstand the, those insults. If you make it too small, electrically it may be kind of okay, but if you dig through it in the shovel, uh, it's not there anymore. You might not even know. So it has to stop that shovel or jam the rototiller or whatever. For your ham station, Inside the ham station, the standard is 20 gauge strap, plus or minus. You can use 22, you can use 18, whatever you can get. That can be surplus flashing. You can buy strap, uh, rolls of strap. Um, that's the standard. That's what they use in the military. That's what they use in commercial installations. If you can use strap, do it. 
it's heavy enough, it meets all the requirements, it's low impedance and low inductance. Heavy wire is also good, number 14 or larger, that's the uh, Romex that you've got stashed in the garage. Finally, you can start getting those little six foot pieces out and stripping off the insulation. For bonding, it can be insulated wire too, it doesn't have to be bare. You can use flat weave tin braid. That's the uh, silver stuff. If your equipment moves around, like mobile stations in particular deal with this, or if you've got um, a roll around amplifier or power supply or something, you wanna keep your grounding uh, connection to it. Um, flat weave tin braid is okay, um, but do not let it get wet. Don't let get chemicals in it because then all those little wires that are connected together, um, they get corroded and suddenly you have a, a big long strap of terrible connections and they make noise and they make harmonics and all sorts of other things. Um, also, don't use exposed braid from old coax. You got some ratty old 213 or eight from World War II surplus. You say, well, I'll just use this braid. So you take off the jacket and loosen it up and take it off the center insulator. We've all done it, I have. And it's nice and shiny. And um, you say, well, it worked at RF with cable, it worked fine as grounding. Not so. That braid only works because the jacket is there to keep those wires clamp together. It, it keeps them pressed together and it keeps water and oxygen away from them. The minute you take it out of that jacket, it starts to corrode and it loosens up. And as a matter of fact, you loosen it up, you slide it back and forth and take it off the uh, center wire. It's no longer a compressed solid connector at RF and it will just degrade over time and it just gets worse. So don't use the old coax. If you wanna use old coax for grounding, treat it as big wire, just strip off the end, twist it together, make a pigtail, put on a terminal and uh, let the jacket do its job uh, to protect that, that uh, braid. AC safety grounding, let's jump over to uh, uh, all of our homes and businesses and residences have this AC power. Grounding for AC safety has several names depending on where you are in the country and how old your electrician is. Uh, the current word is equipment ground. That's the standard. That's what you'll see in that big NEC handbook. It's also called third wire ground or green wire ground. They all refer to the same thing. It's that long uh, wire that's part of your Romex that goes back to the uh, service panel and um, it needs to be low resistance because it has two purposes in life and only two. It provides a path back to your AC service common point for fault currents. If there's a short circuit in a uh, power supply or an appliance or whatever, that ground conductor has to be heavy enough to take all of that current and cause the protective component, whatever it is, a circuit breaker or a fuse to open up and remove power from the circuit. That's, um, that's its whole function. Short, uh, short circuits and leakage current from bad insulation, that kind of stuff. You want that flowing on the ground conductor back to the common point. And then you also see the connection from the uh, uh, service box out to a ground rod. And if you trace that out to your power pole, you also see a uh, wire coming down the pole, either your pole or maybe the neighbors and it will go to a ground rod down at the bottom or it will wrap around the bottom of the pole. That's called a butt wrap. And um, it's not a very good ground, but it is a ground. It is a connection to the earth. And there are literally thousands and thousands of these things in any utility of size. All of those parallel connections help stabilize the AC power system voltage during a fault or a transient such as lightning or a phase fault because somebody ran into a power pole or a tree fell on the line or something like that. It helps keep the system voltage from just wildly uh, fly, flailing around and causing a lot of trouble. Um, so that's what the AC safety ground is for. It gives you two reasons, a path back to the AC common for fault current and to stabilize the AC power system voltage doesn't have anything to do with lightning protection or RF management. Here's what 
um, this your typical power uh, supply to your house looks like here's your pig pig on the pole and um, it's got two phases here's a phase and here's a phase and they come this is a center tap transformer and they come to your your house and then there's a neutral that's connected to the center tap here's the ground connection on the pole and if you open your service panel and you take off the uh, protective cover and you look at the scary stuff you'll see two buses. Uh, first, you have the, um, the phase connections that are buried behind the circuit breakers. But you see a neutral bus, and that's where all the white wires are connected. And you see a ground bus, and that's where all the green and bare wires are connected. The ground bus is bolted directly to the middle of the enclosure. And there's a big wire that goes to your grounding electrode outside, which is one or two ground rods or if you live in a desert area uh, to your slab ground where they use the uh, concrete. In your main service panel, there will be a jumper that goes between the neutral and the grounding um, uh, ground buses. And that's your AC service common point right here. So everything that flows back to the AC service uh, because of a fault current or something like that comes here. Um, there are certain circumstances in which this jumper is not present, such as if you have certain kind of outbuildings or, or sub panels. Uh, those are all covered in books like this. This is the wiring book I reference later and uh, also in the NEC handbook. Follow those rules carefully. And it, here's, the, here's a picture of that book. This is the latest uh, edition. If you're not sure what you're doing, and I think most of us could run a branch circuit or put in lighting or what have you. But when you start getting into complicated things like sub panels, um, multiple way switches, all the new dimmers and other smart gadgets that are going in homes now, uh, get a how to reference. This is a very good one, it costs less than 20 bucks, typically available at the big box stores, certainly from Amazon. And uh, there are several other uh, guides out there but get one and then follow it, especially follow the rules for sub panels and outbuildings. A lot of us install a small panel for the station, or maybe we've got a sub panel out in the garage or uh, maybe a shed. Uh, there are special rules for grounding these things and they are there to prevent electrocution shock hazards. Follow those rules. It, you wouldn't think this is a big deal, but it is. Um, Ground uh, faults can cause a lot of electrocutions and uh, concrete, for example, is surprisingly conductive. So you might be standing on your bare feet on a grounded thing when you're fooling around with electricity, that's not a good combination. So the rules have been developed for grounding these panels and they uh, should be followed. I overstress that I'm sure, but nevertheless. If you are not real sure what you're doing, I know we all have ham radio licenses, so we all know exactly what we're doing at all times. It's a good idea to hire a pro electrician to come in and do the work or inspect your work. Um, you may say, that looks fine, thanks. Um, or it may say, you know, you really don't want to do this. Yeah, you want to move this over here, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, your homeowner's insurance or uh, local building codes may require you to get this inspection done um, as part of keeping your insurance and all that. So know what the rules are. Your local code is the law and uh, some places have no code at all um, and others are very, very strict. So uh, know the difference and, um, and it's there, not there to make your life miserable. It's there to make your life longer and to keep you from burning down your house. So um, these are good things to know. Lightning protection. Well, lightning comes from way up in the sky, miles and miles in the sky. So by the time it gets down to your place, it's pretty well made up its mind what it's going to do. And you can't really steer it, but you can help Mr. Lightning make good decisions. Okay, the ones that uh, you would rather, uh, rather have. What does Mr. Lightning want? He wants a heavy direct path to the earth to dissipate the charge and balance in the ground. Sometimes the lightning goes up, sometimes the lightning goes down, but 
Either way, the idea is to disperse charge in the earth so that there is no longer an imbalance between up there and down here. Give Mr. Lightning what he wants, a heavy direct path to the earth. In the case of lightning protection, we talked about AC safety grounding um, conductors needing to have a low enough resistance to handle fault current. For lightning protection, because it's essentially an AC event, it starts at DC, but it has significant energy up to um, 10 megahertz and up into the VHF range. Inductance is more important than resistance. So you've got to worry about short, no bends, uh, wide conductors, that kind of stuff. Inductance is the most important thing. Why? Because uh, when you have a sharply changing current, the voltage from one end to the other of the inductance is equal to the rate of change of that current times the inductance of the conductor. And so when you're talking about kiloamps of change per microsecond, it doesn't take very many nano henrys before you have a lot of volts. Like I mentioned before, even a straight piece of number 12 can have hundreds of volts across it um, under lightning conditions. All these paths that you give Mr. Lightning, make sure they're outside your residence. Don't make it easy for the lightning to go through your house or your station on its way to the earth. I, I, people say, well, it's really kind of a hassle to bury ground conductors outside. Um, it looks bad. Uh, it's in the flower beds, all this kind of stuff. How about if I run the lightning conductor through my crawl space? I said, well, why don't you not do that? You really don't want to have lightning going uh, through your residence. Um, it will couple to uh, AC wiring. It'll couple, couple to your ducts, um, your metal um, AC uh, ducts, meaning air conditioning, all that kind of stuff. It's a bad thing to have lots of current flowing through your house. So don't make it easy for lightning to go through your station. And you have to bond all external earth connections together. This is a must. This is not a should. This is not a well, maybe. This is a must. Uh, what you get is your electrical service is going to have its ground rod or two outside. The telephone people come. They install a ground rod. The cable TV people come. They install a ground rod. You put an antenna on your house for TV or FM or something or two meters and you follow the handbook and you run a uh, number eight, uh, number 10 wire down the side of the house and you have a ground rod. Okay, what are those ground rods connected together with? They're connected with dirt. Okay, what is the resistance of dirt? The resistance of dirt is a lot. If you took a ohm meter and you measured the resistance between these different ground rods outside, you might get 10 ohms, 25 ohms, 100 ohms, and sandy areas, it might be more than that. Okay, so what happens when you get a thousand, a kiloamp pulse flowing through 100 ohms of dirt? Well, you get 100,000 volts, that's what you get. And so what happens is you have all of these different systems in your house that are connected to the earth, but when lightning sized currents flow in the earth outside, the voltage differences between these systems can be enormous. And that's when you hear stories like, I was sitting there minding my own business, there was a thunderstorm outside, and suddenly this giant arc jumped from my computer to my home entertainment system and the phone, and now nothing works in my whole house. Okay, well, what happens was the grounds on these systems were not connected together. They were not bonded. And so instead of everything going up and down together, Part of it went wah like this. And so you've got a voltage arc between these two systems. And it doesn't matter if the other one comes up later. Like, so maybe this one goes up and this one comes up second. That period of time when the voltage difference is there, that's when you get the destructive arcs. So outside, you create what's called a perimeter ground by uh, burying a heavy wire between all of the ground rods. It helps if the ground rods are all together, but it seems uh, difficult to get that done. Um, so you're gonna buy some number six AWG typically and bury it and use ground rod clamps and stuff like that. Create a perimeter ground or ground ring around your, your house. That's where Mr. Lightning will go. That's where you want Mr. Lightning to go. Don't create low impedance paths through your station. 
Okay, here's your tower and your beam outside. Uh, that could be just a dipole with coax. And lightning comes and doesn't even have to hit directly, can just hit nearby. Suddenly you've got big currents flowing in the outside surface of your feed line or in the tower, and it heads straight for your radios. And it gets to that nice entry level, entry panel that you created with the feed through uh, bulkhead PL259s. Well, you got a ground rod right there, good for you. Well, some of the lightning is going to go this way. But some of the lightning is also going to say, gee, look at this. I've got more feed lines here. And they go right through these radios and power supplies. I can get to the AC uh, circuit that way. I go over here to the service entry, and we've got a couple of nice ground rods out there. Uh-oh, uh, you just got a big lightning pulse right through the house and through your radios. That causes damage. Uh, you don't want that. So what do you do? OK, um, here's another example. Say the lightning hits your AC lines and it comes in, comes into your service entry. Well, you've created this new thing now with um, this single point ground panel that we're going to talk about a little bit later. And it's got protectors on it, protectors for feed lines, protectors for AC power. And so here comes the current, but it goes to this nice outside ground rod here, plus all of these great ground rods that you've established outside for your perimeter ground. Mr. Lightning is happy. Mr. Lightning gets to disperse into the earth outside of your house. The protectors route the current down to the ground system, and very little of it will flow through your radio equipment. That's what you want. So give Mr. Lightning the perimeter ground system outside your house so that you disperse the charge into the earth without going through your house and the wiring. Here's a tower, for example. We're looking straight down on a typical triangular lattice tower. We've got a concrete tower base down here. The, the thing you've seen in the handbook for years and years and years is you put in a ground rod for each one of these um, uh, tower legs a, a foot or two away from the tower, and then you connect them all with a ring of heavy wire. Um, and that's great. That's a ground ring around your tower. It's a good thing. What the commercial guys do, and this is a, a highly recommended technique, I did it at my station, is as long as the guy's out there with the backhoe, I had him dig a trench about 30 feet long, not a very big trench, um, a foot or 18 inches deep. And um, I ran some more wire out from the ground rods out to the end of that, put in some more ground rods out there and then buried it back up. You can't see them today. Um, and I did that for each one of the tower legs. And that creates a terrific radial system. These are not antenna radials. These are lightning protection radials and they're buried into the earth. And that entire length of the wire, plus all of the ground rods that you put in, help Mr. Lightning disperse charge into the earth. <coughs> okay, Gesundheit. Uh, so you wanna put in rods and radials. Then you've got feed lines, they come down the tower. Okay, so the, the tower's coming down and you got feed lines coming down. And when you get a tower that's either hit with or has a nearby lightning strike, you can have as much as 100,000 volts between the top and the bottom of a 50 or 60 foot tower just from the inductance and the resistance of the steel and the galvanizing. Okay, if your feed lines are not bonded to the tower, they're gonna be at some other voltage. I don't know what, but it won't be at the same as the tower. And I don't know too many coax jackets that are rated for 100,000 volts. So what happens is you get arcs between the tower leg and the shield of the coax, okay? So the voltage is equalized and that blows a hole in the jacket. You've probably all seen or heard about stories of coax with big long splits and pinholes and all sorts of things. It lets the water in and um, suddenly your coax is, is bad. So what you wanna do is bond the feed lines to tower about every 50 feet. You can use one of these little brackets, the DX Engineering sells them, you can make them. Uh, there are grounding kits from Andrews and other coax manufacturers for Hardline. And basically they bolt onto the tower leg. Yes, you've got to put in more PL59s and yes, that's a pain in the <clears throat> neck and uh, you just have to do it. Um, also, if you've got an insulated base tower and I have three, 
You can also make spark gaps, which can be as simple as two pieces of wire that cross and you just keep them a little bit apart so that uh, it's like gapping a spark plug. You put them about a millimeter or two apart, they'll arc over at about three or 4,000 volts, which is, sounds like a lot of voltage. But once the arc develops, the voltage goes from three or 4,000 down to about 15 to 20 volts until the arc is extinguished. So a spark gap will help clamp any voltage transient that comes down the uh, tower. Over at the uh, uh, station, what you want to construct. Hello, there's an echo. Somebody's out in the mountains. Um, so somewhere either at the entry point, somewhere near the entry point, or even in your station, you create what's called a single point ground panel. And that's where all of your protectors and arresters and all that kind of stuff, all this protection, it's bolted onto one piece of metal. That can be a heavy, fancy, expensive piece of copper. It can be um, aluminum flashing screwed on to a piece of wonderboard. It can be a big uh, copper bus bar, whatever you've got. It's, well, just assume it's a metal panel. And so you bolt all of your protectors. You have data or phone line protectors. You have your control line uh, for your rotators. Uh, it's got a protector. You can get those nice bolt on uh, lightning protectors that have gas discharge tubes in them for feed lines. And you also uh, bolt on one of these things called an AC power protector, like a surge protector, but a big one, not just a little power strip, but, but a good size one. And these create a protected set of wires. Everything above this line here is protected. That's protected power, protected feed lines, control lines, data lines, phone lines, all that kind of stuff. You wanna keep these wires away from the unprotected wires, okay? Because if you bundle them all up, it looks nice, but Mr. Lightning will just skip around your arresters and jump from the uh, unprotected to the protected cables. So keep them apart and you have heavy grounds from this panel to your perimeter or lightning ground system outside. And you also connect that to your station ground bus inside. So what this does is it makes all of the protectors fire at the same time. So even if they go up in voltage, remember you're trying to keep things at the same voltage, you don't want this one going up and then later this one goes up while this one's coming down and then this one starts to come up, you can still get significant voltage differences all through your system. You want them all to go up and down together. So by putting all your arresters on the same panel at the same place, they all fire at the same time. And that uh, helps keep everything at the same voltage to go up and down together. Here's some examples. Uh, this is a, uh, data line protector, telephone line protector, works on DSL, other stuff like that. Here, um, uh, you can find similar ones for rotator control lines. Here are the familiar uh, AC, uh, I'm sorry, lightning protectors for coaxial cables. These are from Polyphaser. DX Engineering makes them, Alpha Delta makes them, ICE makes them. There's a whole bunch of them out there. Um, and this is an AC surge protector and this creates a PLDO, protected line duplex outlet. Um, and so what happens is you take this thing, it's got a bunch of NMOVs and other stuff in it, and you bolt that onto the panel so that um, any uh, transient that goes through the MOVs or whatever else it's got in there, it goes to the ground system. You can buy these things, they're rated in terms of joules, in terms of how much energy they can absorb uh, and clamp. Buy the biggest one that you can get. They're not that expensive. Uh, this isobar with four outlets, uh, you can find them anywhere from 35 to 50 bucks online. You can run your whole station pretty much, except for maybe your amplifiers, through one of these uh, isobar type trip light protectors, surge protectors, or you can make your own um, if you want, but these are not that expensive. It's easier to buy one that professionally made um, and save your money uh, and time for other stuff. And then run all of your computer equipment off of it, 
you can plug power strips into this. So you have one power strip for your computer, one power strip for your radio, one power strip for your HF uh, stuff, one for VHF, whatever. Anyway, you create a protected line duplex outlet. Here's what a single point uh, ground panel looks like. I made my own. This is at one of my three tower bases. I have three towers um, on a ridge in central Missouri. I call it the Crawford County Cumulonimbus Discharge Facility. And um, I know lots and lots of trees have been hit um, when I walked the property before I bought it uh, 12 years ago, um, eh, 10 years ago. Um, I noticed a lot of trees had burn marks on them. Thought, well, I wanted to be up high. I guess this is the deal. So I built the station with lightning protection in mind. Each at the base of each tower is uh, one of these RCS4L. The L means it's lightning protected and has gas discharge tubes in it. Um, it's a four position uh, remote coax switch. Here's the hard line that goes back to the shack. The hard line is, is buried. And here are the antenna feed lines. Here's the big ground wire that goes to the, uh, the, the ground that this thing is mounted on. And then this is my uh, rotator control line. Each one of these has a, a gas discharge tube on it. That's a 75 volt, that's a pretty low voltage gas discharge tube. Um, it's from uh, TDK and uh, the uh, model number is referenced on the grounding and bonding book website and in the grounding and bonding book. Now I'm going to save you a ton of money and make it worth your while to have suffered through this presentation. This is direct burial irrigation system control cable. These are number 18 solid copper wires. There are 10 conductors in this particular cable. So what I did was um, I took one two pairs of wires and doubled them up. Two 18s is as much wire as the number 16. And this works for rotator control lines up to two, three, 400 feet. Okay, so uh, basically I you can buy this stuff for a really low cost. You buy a thousand foot spool of this on eBay. This is sold in volume to landscapers and builders and that kind of stuff. It's way cheaper than the fancy rotator cable that we buy that has two number 16s and, and four or eight number, uh, four or six number 18s. That's a special cable. It's only sold to hams and others. Uh, and so we don't get the benefit of the low cost. If you buy the irrigation cable, you can save a lot of money and um, save the fancy rotator cable for running it up the tower from your single point ground panel, that kind of stuff. Here's another single point ground panel. This is from K4RO. Kirk lives on a hilltop. I have lots of friends that live on hilltops. I'm sure you do too. I don't know why, uh, but we all seem to be on hilltops. Anyway, Kirk uh, lives on a hilltop near Nashville. And uh, every time the, the thunderstorms would come through, he'd lose some piece of equipment, some switch or a filter or a controller or something. And he was just forever replacing it. So he got tired of that. His shack is, this is in his garage. His shack is dead above this panel. So all the, all the cables come down through the floor to this panel. This is just a big piece of aluminum. And every piece of equipment that's um, part of his antenna system, um, his switches, his filters, his stubs, his controllers. You can see a stack match system over here. They're all bolted to this panel. Here's this big wire that goes outside to the ground system. Since he installed this several years ago, he's lost zero pieces of equipment out here. So uh, it really does work, boys and girls. Here's at my station. And um, I have a station with two operating positions in it. And between the operating positions, I put everything in a big metal rack. You can get these for free. People are just like, get this out of here. So I took a six foot rack, I put my amplifiers in it, I put my um, six pack controller, uh, it's on the other side of this, here's my RCS4 switches, here's my rotators, an auxiliary power supply, a bunch of other stuff. And that is bonded to each one of these operating positions. And then another, this is the back of it, 
you can see another big wire goes down here and goes out through the floor and out through the wall. A, a few feet away is the perimeter ground system, and that's what it connects to. And this is my remote uh, power switching thing right here. You can see the amplifier connectors and the relays that control them. Here's one of those antenna line protectors that's bolted. So this is my single point ground panel, this big rack. Everything is bolted onto that and tied down good. Here you can see ground wires for the, uh, uh, for the amplifiers. So let's uh, jump over to lightning protection for a minute. This is from Ron Block's uh, QST articles, and he talks about the concept of a protected zone. Okay, so you want to protect all of the equipment in this room or on this table or in this rack or maybe in your whole house. I don't know. And so you sit down with a piece of paper and you identify every stinking piece of equipment that is connected to anything and all of its power and control lines. For example, even a clock, if you wanna protect the clock and it's got a little tiny 120 volt power plug, that's gotta be protected too. So everything in this zone of protection, you draw all of your lines that go outside the zone and you account for them and you protect each one. Everything that crosses that boundary has to be protected somehow. It might be through a PLDO, it might be through a um, lightning arrestor, and they have those for 75 ohm cable and receive antennas too. It might be through some kind of other surge protector, whatever. The one circuit that you don't protect, that's where lightning will come in. And if lightning gets in there, it can be as bad as having no protection at all. So you need to bond your equipment within the zone and you have to protect all the lines that cross the boundary. Simple idea, not so easy in practice. Okay, let's talk a little bit about RF. Um, RF in your station, you gotta remember that everything in the station is an antenna, absolutely everything. Uh, you're right in the near field of your antennas. They, you may say, well, but it's way out of the backyard. What's the uh, wavelength of a 40 meter signal? 40 meters, that's 120 feet, plus or minus 130 feet. Okay, anything within 10 wavelengths of that antenna is considered to be in the near field. Are you in the near field? You bet you are. Okay, so your feed lines, your wiring in the station, your shielded microphone cable, your power supplies, your AC safety ground, AC wiring is great for picking up stuff. Um, all of your USB cables, everything, that's all part of your antenna system. Even you, ladies and gentlemen, are part of the, in, of the antenna system. You are conductive on your skin and you will pick up RF just like anything else. So all of this is part of your station and you have to deal with what happens when RF comes in and is picked up. So forget about an RF ground. You're not gonna create a magical zero point thing that if you just connect your stuff to this zero point, uh, zero voltage point, uh, it'll be protected and everything will be fine. So forget about it. Concentrate instead on bonding. Everything needs to be bonded together so it all goes up and down together at AC, at lightning frequencies and at RF. You keep your connections electrically short and you keep everything at the same voltage. I gotta stress that, makes a big difference. It also helps signal quality. It improves audio performance as well. We have less hum and buzz if you do good bonding. You're, if you've got an amplifier, you will have high RF field strength and you have to pay extra attention to bonding, not, not only of the amplifier, but to everything that's subjected to the signal from Mr. Amplifier. So the, my recommendation is to create a common reference plane or a common RF grounding bus. We've all seen this uh, drawing in the handbook for low these many years. It's been modified recently based on uh, my reviewers. Um, so instead of just using a hose clamp, we don't use hose clamps, ladies and gentlemen. Hose clamps are not designed for this. I know we've all used them. I certainly did for a long time until somebody pointed out that they loosen up. Um, you can tighten them as much as you want, but if you're tightening them on a 
metal pipe, that metal pipe is not very flexible. So what's going to flex is that little stainless steel band. It's going to get bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. It's going to loosen itself up over time. Hose clamps are designed to be connected to, I don't know, hoses. And hoses are rubber. And so they flex and so they act differently. So what you want to do is go out and get ground clamps and those little acorn clamps that you can buy in the contractor bags at Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever, and use those on your uh, on your half inch piece of copper pipe that you've got in back of your station like everybody seems to. Another thing you can do is put in screws uh, that will tighten down and use lock washers and put a little terminal on there and clamp it down good. That works as well. Use materials that are designed for the intended purpose, either a ground clamp or a screw connection. And then you use a heavy wire to all of your equipment, including the computer. And even if the equipment doesn't have power to it, like an antenna switch, it's part of the system. Tie it all together. This eliminates the hot spots. You know, we've all been in the situation where, well, on 15 meters, I can't sit over here because then I get bit by the microphone. OK, well, we don't want hot spots. The bonding everything together, it's all at the same voltage. It means there's no hot spots. And, and reduces buzz and hum uh, in your audio, which is increasingly important as we start using low level audio to communicate with the digital modes. It also reduces RFI from common mode current. Why does common mode current flow? Because there's different voltages here than here. So current flows between these two points. If you keep everything at the same voltage, you have less current. Less current means less RFI. Okay, all this good stuff. So in back of your gear, use the shortest cable you can to connect things together. Use a bonding bus in a reference plane, which is just a sheet of metal underneath all your stuff. I have some pictures in a second. Remember we talked about ground loops. Any one of these paths here, like this one, that's a ground loop. How many ground loops do you see there? There's at least a dozen. OK, and you can't get rid of these things. So what you want to do is minimize the loop area. The amount of voltage induced in a loop by a magnetic field um, or an electromagnetic field, like an RF signal, is proportional to the area. If you make the area small, you make the induced voltage small. That keeps the current small. Use shielded cables for everything, OK? Uh, even if it's just a little switch or something. I think the only thing we can really get away with uh, not being shielded is power cables. And you can twist those. As you twist those, you minimize the area and you balance them so that the same amount of RF is picked up on the, each wire and it doesn't create a differential mode signal that causes a problem in the equipment. Short straps or wires. And if you have to use braid, use braid that's still in the original coax cable or use the flat weave uh, tin braid. Here's an example. This is at my station. I got some aluminum flashing, 12 foot aluminum flashing. I took this poor defenseless Costco table and I just uh, punched a bunch of holes in it, screwed this stuff down. All my equipment sits close to it or over it. And I run all the cables. I lay them right on this ground plane. The ground plane shorts out an RF wave that's coming in and it doesn't let it induce big voltage differences between, say, over here and over here. It doesn't make all the voltages go to zero, but it helps reduce them. And by laying your cables on this ground plane and keeping them short, you minimize the amount of voltage and you minimize the amount of current. So let's talk about your ground system. First thing to remember now that you created this ground system, and we've worried about AC and lightning and RF, is that all currents flow on all wires. AC safety current doesn't go, oh, that's a lightning ground. I can't flow on that. And RF doesn't say, oh, I'm sorry, that's lightning ground. I can't go there. All currents flow on all wires. So you want to make one good system that works for everything. A single solid ground system, short, heavy, direct connection satisfies all the requirements. And that big perimeter ground system, yes, it's a pain in the neck, keeps Mr. Lightning outside. That's what you want. Let's talk about mobiles for a few minutes. The RF issues can be more intense because you're so close to the antennas. You're actually sitting inside the antenna ground plane. 
you have special power wiring considerations, and that's especially true with modern vehicles. Um, there are bonding issues to discuss. Uh, the modern vehicle bodies are not bonded together the way we they were when we all drove Detroit iron and uh, everything was uh, metal from end to end. And uh, mounting antennas is also important. Let's talk about mobile power. You've got to worry about fusing. You've got to worry about uh, ampacity, which is the ability of a wire to carry current, and uh, the voltage drop caused by large currents flowing through the wire. Um, the power return and battery monitoring system are important today. Used to be we just connected everything up to the battery, no problem. Okay, doesn't work that way now because of uh, uh, computer driven vehicles, which make the vehicles much more reliable, but we have to be more careful with how we connect um, our power to them, particularly battery monitoring systems. Uh, RF pickup can be a real problem with power because you're running these wires all over. Um, we'll talk about a couple of techniques for that. And then there's these things called DC to DC boosters, which are used in modern vehicles, and some of us use them to run our ham equipment. Fuses, both leads from your radio, always. No question, one in the positive, one in the negative. The power cables that you get nowadays have fuses in both leads. Don't take one out. You want to fuse in your negative lead so that if there's a short circuit someplace else, it doesn't decide that uh, that circuit says, oh, I'll just flow through this radio of uh, several hundred amps. Uh -uh. You don't want that to happen. So put a fuse in uh, the negative lead as well. You've got to make sure that the power connection is properly rated. You can find power sockets in the vehicle. We used to call them cigarette lighters, but they're now called auxiliary power sockets or something. Very few of them are rated more than seven to 10 amps. They will not run a full-size uh, transceiver very long, okay? And you don't wanna burn up your, uh, your wiring for these things. Uh, they're expensive to replace. So your power wiring has to be adequately sized. You can determine the maximum uh, resistance by determining what your maximum voltage drop is that you can allow and divide that by your maximum current. For example, if I decide that I can stand 0.5 volts of voltage drop when I'm running a 25 amp load, that means I can only have 0.02 ohms of resistance. If I look up in my wire tables, that's 20 feet of number 10 AWG wire. And I've got to account for my connector voltage drops as well. Remember that mobile radios need at least 11 volts to work right. Even if they're 12 volt radios, uh, once you start getting below 12 volts, they don't really like it and they start doing weird things. Uh, they really wanna be run at 13.8 volts. So um, that's why some of us uh, use DC to DC boosters, make sure the radio is happy regardless of what the uh, automotive system voltage is. Here's the power return connection that I was talking about. Okay, here's a typical vehicle power system, uh, greatly oversimplified. Uh, here's the battery, a starting battery, and, and a 12 volt vehicle. I'm not talking about Teslas and all that kind of stuff. So the starter motor is gonna have a heavy cable that comes from the positive terminal through the uh, starting controller uh, solenoid, and then it's gonna have a big heavy cable that goes to a chassis ground point somewhere uh, typically on a wheel well or some piece of metal that's connected to the um, engine block. Okay, all right, used to be in the old days, well, we would just connect our positive wire right over here, and you can still do that, and we would connect our negative wire to the battery. Oh, the problem now is you've got this thing called a battery sensor here. What that does is it monitors the current, it looks something like this. If you look at your battery, you've got some doodad attached to the negative uh, terminal. That's a battery monitoring system. You can see this main cable disappearing down somewhere into the bowels of your engine compartment. That's this connection here. Battery system, uh, battery sensor, the battery monitoring system keeps track of how much current, how many electrons are going in and out of your battery. And so it keeps track of it so it can keep the battery fully charged. This is particularly important on automobiles that have engine idle shutoff. In other words, you pull up at a stoplight, it turns the engine off. So that puts a whole lot of start-stop cycles on battery. 
And uh, it's important to keep track of uh, where that battery charge level is. If you connect your radio ground here instead of down here, and i.e. directly to the battery, you upset the battery monitoring system because it doesn't know about your radio current. And so you can cause the battery's total charge to shift over time, and that's not a good thing. OK, so when you're running your power back to the radio, it's a good idea to twist the connectors together or use special twisted pair that you can make yourself that balances the uh, wires. They're still going to pick up RF from the uh, antenna, but it won't turn into a differential mode signal between the wires, and that's what causes the problem. So you twist those guys together. If you're going to put a ferrite choke uh, on your power, this is where to do it. If you're going to use a DC to DC booster to level out the uh, voltage to your radio, connect it directly to the battery. Um, and its ground should also go to this chassis ground point. Do not use the vehicle DC to DC boosters that are there to keep your electronics running during these frequent start and stop cycles. They are not made to run ham gear, which is a 20 or 25 amp load, and um, you'll cause problems. So don't do that. Put in your own DC to DC converter. Oh, I already told you that. OK, this is called home run wiring. Um, if you talk to a, an installer or something and you talk about home run wiring, they will know what you mean. That means everything runs to this chassis ground point. You don't assume someplace else in the vehicle, like a fender or a body screw or something like that, is a good connection back to your chassis ground point. You may not be connected at all. Different sections that may be insulated with shock bushings. I know pickup truck beds are frequently not connected to the frame directly. They, they have to be bonded with a strap. Um, you can have all kinds of reasons why parts of the vehicle are not connected uh, with respect to DC um, to the main part of your vehicle. So use home run wiring and run everything directly back to the battery. Already talked about that. I'm getting ahead of myself. OK. So we just talked about body components not always being well bonded, or, or sometimes they're not even metal. Uh, they're composite or plastic. Don't use these subsystem ground points. If you look in your car, you'll find different places where the headlight systems um, or some kind of other load uses a common chassis ground point, and then one wire goes off to the main chassis ground point. Do not use those as convenient points for your ham station. Um, the other systems can inject a bunch of strange voltages and current that causes um, all kinds of strange issues. You, your radio can inject weird currents into these other systems. It acts like strange, hard to troubleshoot RF problems. Save yourself a whole bunch of trouble. Don't use them. Run your power back to the battery uh, common uh, ground point. Bonding to the body. Uh, just is asking for trouble in modern vehicles because it creates all kinds of weird power and RF return paths that you can't control. Protect all of your connections with anti-corrosion compounds, which are available at any auto parts store. When you're mounting the equipment, a single piece of radio equipment doesn't need to be bonded to the, to the uh, vehicle at all. It's designed to work just fine sitting um, on an insulating shelf. It works just fine all by itself. That's how they build them. And uh, you don't have to mount that to any kind of a metal panel or anything. Um, if you want to bond several pieces of equipment together, consider a sub panel um, and mount that all together and then mount it um, to the vehicle using some kind of plastic insulator or um, shoulder washers or something, or maybe just one uh, screw. Remember, the body panels are part of the antenna system. Um, RF current is going to be flowing all over those things. They're not at zero volts. And never bond your control heads to the body. The control head is designed to work independently of any other ground. And sometimes they have strange grounding schemes that keep RF out of microphone circuits and other things. And when you connect your control head to the body of vehicle, you create an opportunity for all kinds of strange things to happen um, uh, where your control head won't operate properly. You get RF feedback type of problems. Just, just don't do it. Leave your control head as it is. Follow the manufacturer's instructions. 
Another good way to do uh, mobile is standalone mini racks. Here's a couple of good examples where everything is mounted in a standalone metal rack that you can um, completely remove from the vehicle. Truck toolboxes are great for this. These carry case stations that you see here, this may cause some security issues because somebody else can pick up your stuff and walk off of it unless you put it in the trunk. But this is a good way to control all of the RF paths within your station. Everything is bonded together right in these little racks and uh, with only antenna and power connections coming off. Um, so there's really no need for a vehicle bond unless you absolutely have to for some reason. Okay, uh, when you're mounting equipment, mechanical security is really important. You do not want uh, radios flying around the passenger compartment. If you have a rollover or any kind of an accident, these things, you know how much they weigh. Do you want one of those things banging around in your car, hitting you in the head and everything else? No. So bolt them down, put them under seats, whatever you got to do. I know we've all done it. I have to. You take your little two meter rig and you stuff it down between the seat and the, con and the, uh, the center console. Don't do that. Spend an afternoon, a happy afternoon, um, wiring your uh, radio in and getting it under the seat or whatever. Watch out for airbags. There are airbags everywhere in vehicles now. Uh, they're in the dashboard, they're in the side panels, they're in the overhead things. Uh, do not put your radios mounted in front of where an airbag is suddenly going to emerge at 100 miles an hour. That, that radio will also take off at 100 miles an hour. And where are those airbags? They come in right at your face to protect you uh, uh, from hitting something. So what will happen is you'll hit the radio first and then the airbag. So your airbag will protect the radio, but not you. Don't mount your radios anywhere near where an airbag comes out. If you have questions about where this is, go talk to your dealer. They will show you. And there are uh, uh, definitely um, service bulletins and other things that show you how to safely mount radios in cars. Under these trim strips that are along the doors and side panels, you can remove those. And that's frequently where they run wiring. That's a great place to run it. It's protected and it also helps shield the wires from direct RF pickup. Watch out for hitting, hidden wiring when you're drilling a hole in your car. Uh, don't run that drill bit all the way in zzz, and, and suddenly find out that that's where they ran a uh, 12 volt line to the trunk or something like that. Drill just a little bit into your car and if you can find a service bulletin that shows where the wiring stuff is, get it, it's worth the money, and it can keep you from a really expensive electrical problem. When you're mounting an antenna, make sure you bond the antenna to the body panel, assuming it's metal, at the antenna, not back at the edge of the panel, not uh, down by your radio or something like that. Um, your cable will become part of the antenna in that case. So you want a through hole NMO. Those are probably the best um, uh, mounting style for um, amateur antennas. You definitely want to mount things securely to the vehicle. A lip mount may need an additional body bond, something that goes on a hatchback, um, on a trunk, on a hood, whatever, that clips onto the metal at the side. You, um, you need an additional body bond. They have the little set screws that bite into the metal, but uh, what you should do is uh, run a uh, small strap or wire to the nearest possible body screw and make sure you're well connected to the body. Beware of paint getting under things. Um, stuff that looks like it should be a good solid connection often isn't because there's a layer of paint and that paint's really sturdy. They're really good about um, how they paint stuff these days. Mag mounts don't work at HF. Uh, they're only about 100 picofarads per magnet. So even a three magnet HF mount, you've got, you're putting 300 picofarads in series with your antenna and at lower frequencies, that's a lot of uh, reactants. So that's gonna detune the antenna. Um, there's just insufficient coupling. So if you're using a mag mount HF, you can expect your coax shield to be the ground plane of the antenna. This causes RFI, um, you need to, if you can at all, use a through panel mount or uh, something attached to the body. 
So if you've got a coax that's part of your bang mount, uh, run an extra body bond wire to the nearest possible body screw. So that takes the load off your coax cable, gives the antenna current some place to flow right back to the antenna and not all the way down to the radio and then all the way back. So you want to decouple at the antenna. That's where a good, good place for an RF choke is. Wind some cable on a ferrite core and at the radio. So keep that current from going where it's not supposed to. Look for, if you're buying a uh, new car, ask about upfit packages. Um, the salesman may not know about it, but a fleet salesman certainly will. These are packages, uh, they're not, not as expensive as you might think, that put uh, radio equipment in a car for a fleet. Uh, police cars have them, um, all sorts of delivery and other services have them. And these are known packages. Uh, your manufacturer can probably uh, sell you one and for a few hundred bucks you get heavy duty wiring, you get special brackets, you get maybe a heavy alternator, et cetera. Look into service bulletins for mounting radios in your car. The manufacturers have these. You can either find them online or you can get them through the service department. Fleet sales, resales, uh, look for cars that have already had these things put in. Police cars. Um, used to be you could get a Crown Victoria, you know, as long as it hadn't been abused too badly. Um, you know, it was a pretty solid vehicle. Um, but there are a lot of free fleet cars out there with uh, radio stuff already has been installed. The radios are no longer there, but you can put your stuff there. Service departments will give you guidance and opinions. Car audio shops are also uh, treasure troves of information and they probably install a lot of radios themselves. Are we done yet? Yes, we're almost done. I wanna say thank you. Um, I'm supplying the PDFs of this talk to your club leadership so they can post them. Uh, feel free to share them. None of this stuff is copyrighted. Um, my goal is to get the information out there. If you want to buy one of these books from the league, they've sold a ton of them. Um, and a lot of people have learned some stuff from them. So anyway, thanks. And I'm open for questions. If anybody's added a question via the Q&A and the chat, uh, now would be a good time to uh, read them to me. Not all at once now. I've got a, a couple of questions. Um, uh -huh. When you're mounting an antenna in an attic, do you have to uh, consider lightning protection for the antenna or the feed line? You know, assuming the feed line's all inside as well. Well, usually not. Um, if it makes you feel better, uh, follow the NEC uh, handbook guidelines. And if you have local building codes that specify grounding for internal um, antennas follow those, uh, mm -hmm. um, but try to avoid running ground wires near uh, air conditioning ducts and things like that that run through the attic uh, wiring because any kind of a, a lightning pulse nearby couples to those things. It, it's typically not an issue. Uh, lightning does not hit things in houses. But if it makes you feel better, run a ground wire outside. OK, and another question. My ham shack's on the second floor of a house. So I assume any antennas I have mounted outside or on the roof, I want to run my coax down to the ground, run them through some lightning protection that's then bounded or bonded to the ground system. Yep. But then when that coax goes back up outside the house to the second uh, floor and through a window mount, do I have to do any sort of, uh, you know, grounding, tie the shields together, or have a ground wire from that uh, down to my ground system? Okay. Well, I'm sitting in a second floor shack right now in an old house, and uh, so I've had the same problem. Think of it as being in an airplane. Uh, you're basically too far from the ground to have an effective ground conductor. I mean, you could run foot-wide strap down to a ground uh, rod and it would still have too much inductance to really be too much, uh, too helpful. So uh, long story short, um, these little feed through panels are handy, but they are not sufficient to use as a ground panel. Create a single point ground panel in your shack, in your station, um, 
It can be as simple as what I've done, which is uh, aluminum flashing on um, some shelving and that holds my radio equipment. And then bolt a uh, lightning protector there. You also want to ground the coax shields down at the uh, uh, down at the ground uh, so that any uh, current and stuff has an opportunity to go to ground. Then you run them up through this panel to your single point ground panel in the station. Lightning protectors, AC uh, surge protectors, uh, data or phone protectors all mounted on the same thing and so that all of it goes up and down together. If you do get hit by lightning or have lightning nearby, what can happen is all of the equipment can go to a very high voltage simply because you're up above the ground. You're not connected to the ground. And then your AC safety and your other ground leads that go outside, they will gradually drain off the charge. So you get a big, big pulse and then it comes back down. That's a good reason to not be in your second floor station when there is a lightning storm. So. Okay, just to uh, clarify, so then I would not connect that second floor single point ground system down to the actual ground rods. Is that correct? It would just be floating? Go ahead and do it. It will not hurt anything, but make sure it's connected to the AC safety ground and sure, run a number eight, number 10, whatever, what have you, down to a ground rod outside. The, the main thing is you want to keep everything going up and down together in the station and have a path to drain off that charge. And that'll either happen through the AC safety ground or through the ground wire to an external ground system. I have a question. Go for it. I, I do some portable operations. So I, I take HF rig up to Rocky Mountain National Park to 9,000 feet where there's no signal, no, there's no ground noise, and uh, uh, a simple hamstick dipole works great for me. Mm -hmm. uh, 2016, I worked uh, 700 stations from Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, plus a couple hundred from uh, Fort Laramie up in Wyoming. But uh, the, my point is, is that I'm using a different car now. I'm using the same coax, the same radios, the same antennas, the same mast, you know, with a Toyota Camry, and I've got a lot of RF in my shack or in my car. Is there? I don't tie it to the chassis ground. I don't do. Um, it's it's basically a separate battery in the back trunk of the car. And it's a cell phone tower battery, and uh, I wondered what suggestions you might have that would help me uh, reduce okay. the RF cross the problem that I have. And what what you're talking about, just to make sure I understand the question, is you have a, a lot of RF that's picked up from the antenna and conducted into where your equipment is, correct? Yeah, my radio shuts itself off. Yeah, yeah, I have that problem with the IC7000 in my Subaru. Um, if I'm not real careful about where um, uh, I run the cables in the car, um, the control head wiring for the 7000 is not shielded and, um, and it will kick off on a couple of bands. So what I've done is add ferrite cores to the control head wiring and other stuff. You're sitting right in a, a big bath of RF. Um, if your antenna is mounted on one of the front metal planes. Front tire, 12 feet high. Okay. I have oh. a, a mili military fiberglass uh, mask. Oh, uh, this, is when you're, this is when you're stopped. You're, you're stopped. You're not driving around. This is, no, I'm, not, I'm portable, oh, okay. not mobile. Okay, so your, your antenna is radiating and it's being picked up by the feed line and the feed line is conducting that into the into the station. That's probably it. The first thing I would do is um, put ferrite chokes at the antenna on the feed line and then again where the feed line enters the vehicle. I'd start there. 
and I would use type 31 um, for HF and use the big 2.4 inch um, OD ferrites and you can get quite a few turns of um, feed line through those things and um, and that's where I'd start and anything that is sensitive like the um, um, like the control head for the radio uh, you can typically wind that through a core as well that's that's six, been successful for me I just set the radio either between the two front seats and then I sit in the back seat uh, the coax comes in through the driver's window mm -hmm. um, just uh, if, if it's January it's not open very wide okay so you don't have a control head. You've just no, got the radio no, sitting right there. No, I don't have a good control head operating. I'd order a box of type 31 2.4 inch OD ferrites and start putting them um, on the feed line at the radio, at the antenna, where the feed line enters the vehicle, and then um, on the power um, and any control lines that you have going to the radio. Yeah, I've got a bunch of ferrites at both ends of the coax. What but kind? The, no, I don't know. They're the type that you could stand to the ham radio outlet and reach into a little box. Yeah, little, the, thing, the, the, little the, thing like this. Yeah, those are too small. Um, too uh, small? Yeah, do you know what, what mix those are? Uh, they have no identification on them. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll try not to launch into my standard ferrite talk. Um, unless you know what mix they are, you can probably assume they're type 43, which works best for RF suppression at upper HF and lower VHF. The mix you want to use for HF work is 31, and it looks like a big resistor uh, to block. It, it's called an EMI suppression component. So uh, you can buy the clip-ons that go on the um, uh, cable, but each one only adds, I don't know, 50 or 100 ohms. What you really want is these big cores. They look ugly, but they work. And then wind as many turns as you can get on these things, seven, eight, nine, 10 turns um, without the uh, connector, and then put the connector on and connect it to your radio. Because um, you're going to have to put uh, 500 ohms, 1,000 ohms, maybe more in series with the outer surface of your coaxial cable to block that current. Okay, I'm lost. What is that I'm, I'm taking the tear, I'm creating a toroid? What you're doing is when you wind, uh, when you put a ferrite core on a cable, um, what that creates in the outer surface of that cable is a um, it can either, it's a combination of inductance and resistance because of the ferrite. It's like, a, it's a magnetic core. So what you want is the ferrite cores that act mostly resistive at the frequency of interest. At HF, that's type 31 ferrite. You need to read um, Jim Brown, K9YC's tutorial on ferrites. It's one of the ones that I listed in the um, opening slides. And he goes into this in some detail, and he'll, he even has a parts list um, of what to order at the back of uh, the tutorial. Okay, that's his web page is k9yc.com. K9y Yankee Charlie. Yankee Charlie.com. Okay, so I'll make a note to read this. Excellent paper. It, it gives you more information than you need, but skim through it. You'll find parts that make sense, and um, and it's good stuff. Well, I didn't have the problem with the other car, but I totaled it. So well, I'm using, doggone. I'm you know, using... it, it, it depends. You know, <laughs> it depends. Everything, you're so close to the vehicle that the, the hood, the quarter panels, the roof, the everything, the doors, couple and they're part of that antenna. Maybe with the other car, the configuration of those panels and the roof and stuff were such that you didn't have enough RF to cause the problem inside. And now with the, this new car, uh, it's configured in such a way that it allows more RF to get in. 
I'm not saying the other car had zero RF, it just didn't have enough RF to cause you the problem. And now with the new car, same antenna, same basic setup, oh, you've got RF, um, enough RF on your cable to cause a problem. And that's yeah. typically kind of a threshold thing where, you know, any current below this is fine. And then all of a sudden any current above this causes this problem. So you've got enough RF, but that's how I'd attack it. Or is the RF coming through the, uh, the cable between the battery and the radio? And the that it could be in, that's in the those, trunk. Those are typically the power connections to radios are pretty well bypassed. If you look at the video input power circuit, they'll have inductors in series, they'll have bypass capacitors, and typically they're pretty inert, although in some cases it's a problem. I think your main problem is RF flowing down the outside of your feed line, getting onto the enclosure of the radio and then coupling into control circuits of the radio, either through microphones, which have all kinds of control stuff in them now, or any kind of control line, your audio, um, headphones, speakers, whatever. Well, it sounds like moving the antenna 20 feet from the car would not make a difference. Most problems like this are threshold type problems. If you can reduce the current enough, suddenly your problem disappears. It's not a linear problem where it's little and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like you have no problems with this thing turning off sporadically until current gets to here and then all of a sudden it happens. So if you can block the current or reduce the current in any way, including moving the antenna farther away, it's good stuff. Okay, thank you. Yeah, look at um, Alan K0BG bravogolf.com and his website has a bunch of information about RFI there too. K0BG mm -hmm. K0BG.com Yep. Anything in your book? What's that? Anything in your book that would help me? Yeah, he's uh, he's written a bunch of stuff in the book and we're working on adding to the book. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments, suggestions? How about those Yankees? <laughs> Sounds like I'm done. Well, Ward, I don't have a question, but I wanted to say as a new ham and, and just getting my ham shack started, I can't thank you enough for just uh, wetting our, uh, my appetite and going and looking and finding all this detail and wonderful presentation. Uh, can't thank, thank you. you enough. Thank you. Um, I've given it a bunch of times and, you know, I could go on for hours, you know, on certain topics, but the idea is just to alert people that this is an issue, that it, um, it's something they can address. It's not terribly expensive, uh, but, you know, um, here's, here's the deal. Here's how to do it. So thank my reviewers. They're really good. <laughs> Yeah, I had I had one question. I know, and we put up uh, kind of a tower was the microwave, and we had to get it inspected. And they wanted uh, an ooper ground in the concrete in the tower. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little about that, or sure, I mean, is that more from a commercial type, or is that something that we put well, in the concrete it's, above the tower? It, it's very common, um, particularly in desert and uh, rocky soil areas, or you know, rock areas putting up a tower on a mountain is definitely where you're going to find this. Concrete is surprisingly conductive. Um, it's not, I mean, if you put a voltmeter on it, you won't see uh, zero ohms, but what happens is there's so much area there and the concrete is mildly conductive and you've got rebar in it um, to help conduct current is it forms a, an effective electrode in contact with the earth, both for um, AC safety and for lightning protection. The army developed this in Arizona um, after World War II. Um, so at Ufer Ground is named for, I think it's George Ufer or Fred Ufer or something like that. He's the one that came up with it. 
Basically, it requires 20 feet of copper, heavy copper wire embedded in the concrete. And um, whether that's a tower base or a building slab or driveway, whatever, um, there's a stub that comes up out of the slab and that is your contact to the oofer ground. Um, typically that works pretty well for lightning protection, AC safety. Um, it's, I don't really know how well it works above a few megahertz. There doesn't seem to be any literature on this at all. Um, I even asked W3LPL who uh, is recently retired and was a very highly placed um, HF and other communication experts for the government. And even he didn't know about whether this was um, effective at RF or not. But he said it works at RF uh, or at Lightning. We use it in RF facilities. Um, that's all I know or all he could tell me. So the Ufer ground simply uses the volume conductivity of concrete with an embedded copper conductor and the rebar to um, uh, conduct lightning and, and other current into the earth. Uh, it does not cause the lightning, the, the, the heat of the current discharge does not cause concrete to blow up. Although if you have cracks in the base and water gets into the base and typically it'll flow along and rust the rebar. What happens then is if you get a lightning strike well, then current flows through the water and turns it to steam. And steam will blow up just about anything. Um, so that's why you hear these stories about um, lightning blowing up an oofer ground. A proper oofer ground with, with a proper concrete base protected from cracking works just fine. Uh, does that tell you enough? Yeah, do you, I mean, so then if you've, Got your other, um, you know, ground that you put out from the tower legs. Do you bond that together, and then also bond this to your perimeter ground? Okay, so you have your tower ground system. Do you bond it to your perimeter ground system? If the tower is adjacent to, or within anywhere from 50, uh, 50 feet or so of the house, the general consensus is yes, bond, run a bonding conductor along with your feed lines back to the, uh, to the station and connect it to your perimeter ground. Um, uh, if it, and it should be buried. If it's a bare wire, it acts as more grounding conductor. Once you get beyond 50 feet, it starts, the inductance starts to be so high that it doesn't really act as an effective bonding conductor at lightning or AC frequencies. However, that said, if you look at the military standard 419A, it says anything up to 200 feet. But they have a much larger budget <laughs> than I do, and most of us do. So they can afford to run big copper strap a couple hundred feet. For those of us in the, uh, in the real world, I'd say if it's close to your house, it's within 50 feet or so, yes, definitely bond it. Beyond that, it's up to you. If it's convenient to do so, go ahead. Um, it won't hurt anything. Thank you. Yeah, if you, if you are concerned about a commercial facility, putting up a microwave tower, the standard you want to look at and follow is Motorola R56, Radio 56. That is the standard for VHF, UHF communications facilities. And it's a freely available online as PDF. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this was a, a ham installation, but because it was in a commercial uh, building when we, or a com commercial lot when we put the tower up, uh, mm -hmm. they required all, they, that was part of the requirements and the design for the tower was to, yep. to put that in. They were probably driving that requirement out of R56. The commercial guys also have a lot of money too. I wish I had their budget for copper. Okay. That's why me. everybody wants to steal, steal the ground buses. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's, they, they go. They know where the money is, right? Well, that what you know. What I tell people is, when you're going to Hamfest and stuff, now that we're going to have Hamfest again, you're walking around looking at stuff. 
look under the tables for these boxes of junk wire. You know, and the guy will say, yeah, five bucks, 10 bucks, get it the heck out of here. My wife told me to get it out of here. Um, and sometimes you can get some real good deals on various cables, keep them around for bonding conductors, uh, you know, whatever, what have you. Never throw away wire. Here's another question for uh, buried uh, ground bonds. Uh, assuming you use the proper connectors and stuff that are rated for the direct burial and stuff. Right. Is there kind of some rule of thumb for how often you have to recheck that? Or, you know, is that good for 10 years or, or forever? Once, or? once a year, once a year. Um, and um, because you get the full thermal cycle every year and that's what loosens them up. Um, I recommend that if you're going to bury stuff, bite the bullet and use the, you um, uh, the exothermic weldings, the one shots, CAD welds, uh, and they're fun. <laughs> if you like fireworks, um, I just did one the other day. Um, once you get good at it, they're easy and straightforward to do, and uh, they make a solid connection. You'll never have to dig them up ever again. If you do decide to do a burial with clamps, the materials have to be rated um, or listed for direct burial. Typically, there is a DB. Um, in their part number. And um, I found it very useful to use one of these little drain caps um, to put over them in the yard. And uh, that, so you can take that off and, and brush away the bugs and the grass and what have you, and you can still get to the, uh, the connection. Also, take a picture. Now that we all have cameras in our phones and stuff, take a picture showing exactly where that connection is. I guarantee that if you don't, and you don't uh, write down measurements about where it is, you think <laughs> you'll remember where that is. And I guarantee you will not. And you'll be out there d crawling around your hands and knees going, where is that damn thing? Uh, so take a picture of where it is, inspect it once a year. Don't ask me how I know that. I learn all kinds of things the hard way. It's like they say, we learn from experience, but why does it always have to be mine? I don't know. I have Any a other? question for you. Go ahead, Jim. I have a question for you, uh, Jim and Durango. What is your, uh, what is your name and call sign? Ah, uh, Ward Silver, W-A-R-D, last name Silver, S-I-L-V-E-R, and the call sign is November Zero Alpha X-Ray. Okay. First of all, I'd like to say this is probably the best program that I have heard in a long time. I've been a ham for almost 50 years, and uh, you are a fantastic presenter. That was excellent. I stayed awake well, this whole you. hour, hour, hour and a half, whatever it's been. <laughs> no coffee? I stayed awake. <laughs> no. And so I just, want, I just want to let you know it was a fabulous program, and I really appreciate it. Well, thanks. You give something all, 50 or 60 times, it, it, you eventually get it right. All the way from Durango. I, I'm telling you that. <laughs> I, I have friends that live down in Ure. I have to visit them at some point. So Okay. Yeah, we've been up there several times. And by the way, we have a... Uh, uh, oh, I'm trying to... My mind's blank right now. But we have a solar-powered repeater up on uh, uh, Eagle Pass. Up, it's about oh, 11,000 feet solar powered. And it, it, we had to put in a big grounding system up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, some guys from uh, Mountain Bell way back 30 years ago helped us do it. But uh, a lot of the things that you were mentioning tonight, we did at that time, that's some 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, you know, radials, uh, you talk to the cell guys and they put up those monopole towers and up on hills and exposed rock and stuff. And they say, well, you know, we'll drill, uh, put in ground rods and stuff. But what really does it for us is to lay out radials of strap and heavy wire right on the surface and uh, hold it down with epoxy or whatever. And that just helps that charge spread out and they get most of their mileage from that so take yeah. a cue from them very good 
Well, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. And let somebody else come in. Thanks for the kind words, Jim. Brian, have we got anybody else out there typing away? Any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, well, about 10 yeah. o'clock here, so I'm going to pull the big switch and uh, <laughs> uh, you guys have fun, okay? Awesome. Thanks for such a great presentation. It was absolutely wonderful. Okay, I'll send those PDFs, uh, PDFs off right away before I forget. So 73s. Cool. Thanks. 73. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thanks for running the meeting. Those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Chuck KZRITP. I am the uh, current board president. So thank you everyone for joining the meeting this evening. It looks like Brian just posted the uh, radio clubs uh, link site information. So hopefully you want to catch that later, oh. you can. Thanks, Brian. Hey, I just heard that the conifer site up on Conifer Mountain has been moved down. Aurora uh, Amateur Radio Club has put it into um, Critchell, C-R-I-T-C-H-E-L-L. -L. And um, so I just found out about that today. It's a UHF, UHF repeater. Thanks, hey, Steve. <laughs> Everybody ran out of things to say, I guess. <laughs> I didn't talk more radio. I was going to bring my DMR out here to, to uh, New York, but I decided not to. Just brought my little handheld and put a little some frequencies on it. And like I said, I picked up a repeater on Monday that was finishing up on a net that was um, from Canada, the other side of the of Niagara River. So <coughs> pretty interesting listening to that for a couple of minutes while they were finishing up. I've been trying to find other nets out here, but I haven't had time to even get on the radio because of our sightseeing and working, get the stepdaughter's apartment together and stuff like that. So I've had to build desks and bed frames and chairs and all kinds of stuff that you know people need when they move into a new apartment. Yeah. Are you saying you're moving to a new apartment, Chuck? Yeah, they moved out of their dorm room. They're going to be sophomores next year. So her and her oh, roommate yeah. moved. Uh, her roommate she had in her dorm decided to share rent with her. So they got an apartment together. Well, I found a lot of good uh, sites on Echolink. Uh, if you want to find some local ones. In, uh, oh, yeah, I've looked at Echolink, too. And now that they got that CQ, that's pretty... Uh, I haven't had a chance to test that yet, but... Uh, there are people having a lot of fun using the CQ on Echolink and making contacts. So. Where's she going to school, Chuck? University of Buffalo. She's How did you be, pick uh, that? She wanted to get the heck out of Colorado for some reason. Well, yeah, <laughs> Buffalo? Surprising. Wow. And she decided to go to Buffalo. It's a good engineering school. She's uh, taking environmental engineering. It's a very good school for that. Yeah. yeah, she seems to enjoy it. She hasn't been here for the winters yet, but uh, she she's she's enjoying it so far. She thinks she, she has does, been here. She thinks she knows winter. Yeah, what, she does know winter. I told her said so you don't know winter. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever been to the um, uh, Wurlitzer Museum, Chuck? 
No, I haven't been there yet. Uh, we're going to the Carousel Museum tomorrow. I forget nice. the though. Hopefully, do that. Um, I think there was something else we were going to see. We ended up going to Pittsburgh for a couple of days, which was fun. And um, and we uh, we um, we oh, we went to the conservatory out there, which was a lot of fun. We wanted to do the Andy Warhol Museum and a couple other things, but we didn't get a chance to do that. So, but we drove around the city. Which is really it's nice a, and it's all it's 20 a churches. Nice I'm in a very, very nice city. I ate some good pierogies, so I was happy. Hey, Kat, how are you feeling? Oh, pretty good. That's good. Oh. You through that back issue yet, Kat? Or are you still dealing with it? Uh, that's pretty much healed up. I have to start doing exercising again because I haven't been able to do anything for about six weeks. Yeah. Okay, right, Chuck, Mike, did you get the show on the road? Mike, you're running the show tonight. Go for it, buddy. It's all yours. I'm just here for hey. announcements. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. How are you guys? 